Saskatchewan and Jericho. Good morning, saints. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Minister Robbie, but you can call me Robbie. And I'm Minister Beth. And we thank you for joining us for Cyber Sunday School, live from the magnificent edifice on the hill known as Mount Calvary Community Church, the biggest little church in Omaha. And we are studying from the Precept for Living book. And today's date is March the 14th. And the lesson, I love this lesson, taught to me first by uh, Lee Margaret, my Sunday school teacher, and it is Joshua, the prophet of conquest. And by the end of this lesson, we will explain how Joshua acted obediently to the vision from God. Reflect on our inefficiencies when challenges overwhelm us. Oh, this is getting personal. And commit to obeying God, especially in challenging times. I think this one is made especially for me. But if you hear you in this, then please join us. And before we begin today's lesson, we will start like we do each day in a word of prayer. Father God, we call upon you in the name of our Savior Christ Jesus, giving you thanks, Lord God, for another day, another breath, another beat of our heart, heart Father God. It is your grace that has allowed us to see this day. And we thank you, Father God, for the opportunity to join together corporately and with other believers and study your word, Father God. I pray that you show us how to live as you would have us to live and to follow your, uh, to be obedient to your will, even when times are challenging. We give you honor, glory, and praise by faith in the matchless name of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. So today... Um, as I said, we will be studying Joshua, a prophet of conquest, and you will see how he followed the instructions of God to the letter. God gave him a recipe to overcome his foes, and he followed it to the letter, and we can do the same thing today. And we're going to see how um, following and believing in God, even when things don't seem, uh, when things seem to be stacked against you. We're going to see how, in the in focus story, how following God uh, can be rewarding. And that will be read by the beautiful Minister Beth. In the seven years Thomas had worked at his company, his sales team had performed consistently in the top 3%. Thomas had given his best on the job, and he had earned the right to a promotion. Besides, God had placed this desire in his heart long ago. However, Thomas had been told by a lot of people, mostly black, that he would never become a district manager at his company. They don't promote black folk to those positions, he was told repeatedly. Whenever he heard this, however, Thomas simply replied, well, the final decision is really in God's hands. Thomas knew what they said was true, but it was a good company to work for, and he had put in time and talent. Thomas was sad that people who should have been encouraging were most discouraging. Nevertheless, Thomas followed the desire, gave him, and put in his application for the district manager position when it came up in January. He didn't hear anything for a long time. But he just kept praying instead of letting himself worry. In the spring, Thomas was called to a supervisor's office and told the great news. He got the promotion. One of the vice presidents shared with him the company wanted to reach out the African American community. To do this, they would have to hire blacks in high level positions. Thomas said to himself, yeah, that might have been the company's reason for promoting me, but I know that God already had his plan in mind. Why the text quotes, why is it necessary to be faithful if God works his will anyway? Amen. Thank you. 
And that is a great question, one that we should ask ourselves uh, whenever we make plans. Why is it necessary to be faithful if God works his will anyway? We so many times uh, try to set our plans and uh, they're not God's plans. So you should be prepared for God's plans to prevail over anybody else's plans. And when they do, the question is asked, why is it necessary to be faithful if God works his plan, his will anyway? Because you, we have to trust in God. Um, sometimes things seem to be stacked against us. You don't think you're going to get that job or you're not going to pay this bill. Uh, and so you figure out ways to do it. If those don't work, if, if those things don't work, believe me, God's will shall be done. Whether we like it or not, the will of God shall prevail over everything else. Amen? Amen. Amen. So today, we will be studying Joshua. Uh, and he is a mighty man of God. Um, when you read this, you get to realizing that uh, when I was in school, we studied history, American history. This, the Old Testament, uh, primarily is the history of God's people the nation of Israel. And this is, uh, I guess, one of the great generals of the, uh, of the Israel, of God's people, of God's army, uh, Joshua. And we will be studying from the book of Joshua, chapter five, verses 13 through 20. Now, while we're reading, I would like you to keep in mind verse two out of chapter six. Okay, so we're gonna do uh, verse chapter 55, verses 13 through 16, I'm sorry, through 15. Then chapter six, one through five, then 15, 16, and then skip ahead to 20. But while we're reading these verses, I want you to keep in mind verse two of chapter six, which reads, but the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. He, Joshua had received a promise from the Lord to give the city of Jericho along with its king and all its strong warriors. And remember, Jericho was surrounded by a big, strong wall. Now, I don't know how they were going to get past that wall, but we're going to figure it out. And if you have your books, please join with me on page 333 as we read the background. And the background states, Joshua, the mighty Israelite military commander, knew his God and believed he would give his nation the promised land. Militarily, God instructed Joshua to plunge into Palestine. They are still having the same fight. To plunge into Palestine and divide it into north and south. Jericho was the first target to conquer since it lay directly in the path of their destination. So uh, Jericho lay in the valley of the Jordan River. In this lush tropical climate, palm, balsam, sycamore, and henna trees grew. Great and wealthy, Jericho would be an ideal first fruit to sacrifice to God. Amen. He was going to take Jericho and it was going to be the first fruit to sacrifice to God, giving the best to God first. Once the Israelites had safely uh, crossed the Jordan, they commemorated the event by taking 12 stones from the riverbed and placing them at the next night's campsite. One man from each tribe was to select a stone. The stones were to serve as a memorial for instructing future generations about the Lord's intervention at the Jordan River. Other memorials were established as well teaching children about the faith through the use of memorials was an established Israelite practice. After they crossed the Jordan, the manna which had fallen from, he from heaven each day ceased. Since Israel had reached the land of promise, the daily provision of manna was no longer necessary. Now the text poses the question, uh, do you have special memorials or customs to pass on cultural knowledge to the next generation? And um, that's something that we can ask ourselves 
Uh, we're not gonna go too deeply into that. Uh, we are pressed for time, but recognize that um, we have to pass the information that we have on to our children. My parents taught me about Jesus. I had to teach my kid about Jesus, and that's what we're supposed to do. And sometimes there are special memorials and events, holidays, celebrations, where we get together and we celebrate um, the past and where we've, where we've come from and, and where we're going to. Amen? Amen? Now, we are going to start reading. Dig right into the word. And we're going to start at chapter 5 of Joshua, verses 13 through 15. Minister Beth. When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you friend or foe? Neither one, he replied. I am the commander of the Lord's army. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. Amen. I find it interesting how when Joshua asked the man, the angel, said, uh, Are you friend or foe? And his answer was, I am neither one. I am the commander of the Lord's army, not his friend. He's not his enemy. That angel was there to do a job, not to make friends. Go to work, not to make friends, but to do a job. Amen? Amen. Amen. It matters not whether they are friendly or not. We are there to do a job. Now, if you have your books, please join with me on page 334 uh, under the first heading of the in-depth the messenger of the plan. And it reads as such. Prior to the siege of Jericho, Joshua had an encounter that was similar to Moses at the burning bush. There's a theme. I've been watching T.D. Jakes all day about the burning bush. <laughs> and God has come to this man in another form. And Joshua saw a man standing in front of him with his sword drawn. Joshua asked the man, whether he was an enemy or an ally, neither, the man replied. The man identified himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. Upon hearing this, Joshua fell to the ground, face down in reverence. Joshua asked what message the Lord had for him. He was then told to take off his shoes as the place where he was standing was holy. What has God commanded you to worship in? What? When has God commanded you to worship in what seemed to be an impossible situation? Now, um, before we answer that question, I'd like to point out how this man, this man of God, commanded Joshua to take his shoes off because the, the place where he was standing was holy ground. And Joshua not only did that, but he fell on his face in worship. Now, there was a man of God there, an angel or whatever he was. However, he was representing God, which made the ground, that area, holy. Even though the Bible doesn't say that Jehovah God himself showed up right there, <laughs> that ground, that ground was holy because a representative of God was there. So, just by being a representative of the true and living God, that area was sanctified. It was holy ground. And Joshua recognized that and took off his shoes and knew he was on holy ground and he fell on his face and worshiped. What I'm saying is, is being a representative of God brings God into the uh, equation, brings God into the area. Amen. Now the text is asked the question, when has God commanded you to worship? in what seems to be an impossible situation. And many times we do that, and especially when you look at the word worship, it's not just praying or hallelujah. Worship uh, is something that is, is done in truth, in spirit, and in truth. So 
we worship uh, by the things we do. So sometimes you worship in, a, in an impossible situation when you uphold the standards of God in the face of ridicule, in the face of sin. When you stand for God when no one else is, you are worshiping God in an impossible situation. Amen. So we're going to continue reading. Um, and we're going to now read, we're going to skip ahead to, and we're going to go to chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 5, by my queen, Minister Beth. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or out. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Several priests will walk ahead of the ark, and each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse, and the people can charge straight into the town. And the walls came tumbling down. That's Jericho, under the instruction of God. Now, um, the, second the second heading on page 334 is the plan to conquer Jericho. And it reads, the residents of Jericho had anticipated an attack and barred their gates. The city was closed to all incoming and outgoing traffic. They were afraid of Israel's might. That's what God would do. Goes before you and shakes your enemies up. In giving Joshua instructions, the Lord assured him that the victory had already been won. But it was not going to be an ordinary capture. They would not take it by direct force, espionage, or siege tactics. Joshua was not going to need battering rams and heavy armor to enter the city. Instead, the men were to walk around the city walls in silence once a day for six days. Seven priests led the procession, escorting the ark, which symbolized God's presence. The ark went before Israel when they went into battle. In essence, therefore, the Lord went before Israel in every battle. If God's for us, who can stand against us? On the seventh day, the priests and men of war were uh, to walk around the city seven times. Now, after completing the seventh lap, the priests were to blow the trumpets. This would be the signal for the people to shout. The dual purpose of the battle cry was to inspire the troops as it intimidated the army. Uh, I'm sorry, it intimidated the enemy. The walls of Jericho would fall flat. The men would then be able to capture the city with ease because it would be taken by the power of the Lord. The battle was not theirs. All they had to do was obey, and God did the rest. Sometimes God gives us instructions that seem so far-fetched, we just can't believe he is really instructing us. We should remember that God's ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. He knows what is needed at any given time, and he tells us to trust him. He has never let his people down, as scripture shows us again and again. Now, uh, this is something to ask yourself, and the Bible, the text uh, poses this question. What testimony do you have that confirms God's steadfast deliverance? What has God done for you that showed that was proof positive that God is a deliverer consistently? And I mean, I have stories upon stories where it was nothing but the grace of God, where, where God showed up. And, and there's no other explanation but other than this is the work of God. And I'm sure we all have that. For that is... Uh, what is it that by by the faith, by the blood, oh, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Something like that. 
but it's Christ and what he has brought us through, our testimony that, um, that is an overcomer, and that's how we overcome. And there's a testimony in the things that God has delivered you through. Don't forget them. For these are the things that the, that the Bible, is, that the Old Testament was writ, written on, the testimony of other men. So your testimony is more of the word of God. Your testimony is deliverance. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, uh, we're going to conclude our reading uh, on verses 15, 16, and then we're going to skip ahead to verse 20. Minister Beth. On the seventh day, the Israelites got up and dawned and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time, they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, as the priests sounded the long blast on their horns, Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the town. When people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly, the walls of Jer Jericho collapsed, and, <clears throat> and, and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. Amen. Thank you, Minister. So, God delivered this stronghold to Jericho and the army by, Jer by Joshua's obedience. So, we're going to read the final heading on page 334 of the in-depth. is Joshua obeys the plan. And it reads as such. Joshua's instructions may have seemed strange to the people. But they performed the first six days faithfully. On the seventh day, they got up early. The day, this day, they were to increase their daily march and walk around the city seven times. When they had finished marching, marching the seventh time, the priests blew their trumpets, and Joshua commanded the people to shout the victory. The Lord had given them the city. God is able to give us the victory over our enemies when we obey his words and follow his instructions. Let me read that again. God is able to give us the victory over our enemies, over our flesh, over our situations, over anything that sets itself against us when we obey his words and follow his instructions. That wasn't even for y'all. That was for my edification. Amen. As long as God's people are obedient to him, they are witnesses to his mighty power exhibited on their behalf. We may not agree with the Lord's directions for our lives, and we may not even want to accept his principles, but God is never short on his promises. He's not a man that he should lie. He will come through for us Whenever we submit to him and follow his word every day, he will come through for us whenever we submit to him and follow his word every day. What encouragement can you give to a new Christian about trusting God? What encouragement can you give to a new Christian about trusting God? That no matter how bad your life may be going, just believe. You know, God has your back. Just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's not there. Amen. Amen. God always has our back. Uh, the, the encouragement for a, a new believer is that there is no failure in God. Uh, and, and sometimes when things seem chaotic and there is no organization and we can't figure out what's going on, God, has, he sees the organization in the chaos. Not only that, he knows the outcome even before it starts. God is outside of time, so he knows how things are going to turn out. We just have to trust him. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. His very vision is not our vision. Amen. Now, I'm going to uh, briefly read the liberating lesson, and if you have your book, please join with me on page 335. And... Um, I, I really like this. This was uh, powerful to me. And it reads, Miraculous events 
such as the fall of the wall at Jericho, are sometimes difficult for modern-day readers to believe. To our forebearers, however, the fall of the wall of Jericho indicated a stronghold of faith. The old nature, uh, Negro spiritual Joshua fit the battle of Jericho tells the story of God's assurance of victory in a battle against the enemies of his people. As a group of oppressed people, Israel found strength in a God of deliverance, a God who could destroy the enemy. It is critical to always remember that God is a God of deliverance and power. Amen. We, amen. You know, we, our people uh, were uh, drug here. For, we were kidnapped from our, our land and we were brought here and we were oppressed for 400 years. We had to believe in something, some type of deliverance. And the God, uh, the Father of Jesus, the God that, that not only have we chose, but that chose us, is the stronghold of faith that the, uh, the African-American Negro has. Uh, we hold on firmly that God is a deliverer, and he shall deliver us from our oppressors, from our situations. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, because uh, we got to have something to believe in, you know, because... The world seems so bleak, and we live in perilous times, and when you look around you, you can be somewhat discouraged. But the just don't walk by sight. Uh, the things that we see, that those are things that are temporary. We walk by faith. We walk, uh, we eat the, the word of God. We drink the, the water, that the living water. The things that this world offers are not the things that we receive. We live by a whole different code. Uh, <laughs> the money that we spend is not the same currency that you spend. Our currency is faith. That is the currency that we spend in our kingdom, faith. Amen. Now, I'd like to also read uh, the application for living. In fact, I'd like to have my beautiful wife read the application for living for us. Uh, that's on page 335 if you have your book. Look at your own life. Are you taking time to know God now, far in advance of your troubles? Do you take time to praise him during the day, despite what's happening in your life? How is your prayer life? Do you call on God only when you're in need, or do you pray just because it is a tradition? These and other questions should be answered this week as you reflect on this lesson and share it with someone else. At the same time, decide that you are going to follow God no matter where he leads and how impossible it may seem to you. As you open your heart to him, praise him, for he has answered prayers. Amen, amen. I really like that reading um, for several reasons because uh, for one, it talks about prayer life. And prayer changes everything. Prayer changes everything. And it changes your attitude. You know, when you get to praying, when I get to praying, I'm not really praying per se as I was taught. I'm just talking to God or listening to God. And, and pretty soon, he becomes uh, a person to you where you can get to know his characteristics. You get to hear his spirit and, and the words that he puts in you. When you're reading his Bible, when you're reading the word, you can get to hear him. And this is what prayer fosters. It just fosters a relationship with a true and living God, a, a good friend. Yeah, and sometimes you can even pray about things that may seem stupid to other people, but to you, they may think you're crazy, but... Uh, for example, when uh, we were in the grocery store, and my husband loves orange juice, and he was walking down the aisle, and the guy took the last orange juice, and he's like, oh, please let there be some more. Please, God, please, God, please, God, let there be some more orange juice, please. Put some orange juice on there. And sure enough, the man behind the freezer was adding more orange juice, and he's like, thank you, hallelujah. <laughs> Everybody at the store looked at him like, okay. 
but he knew I mean, well, that just... he needed the orange juice for a reason, and he prayed for it, and God answered his prayers. Yes, and, and the thing is, is I kind of look for God in everything. Uh, I, I, God, now, sometimes, it's, you know, you, you shouldn't look for God in everything, because honestly, I looked for him in, in the Super Bowl. Now, those are frivolous things to look for God for my team to win. And Creighton's game yesterday. Yeah, don't, okay, we're not going to bring that up because they got smacked. <laughs> However, praying for God for some frivolous, I, I, I'm to the point where I'm constantly talking to God. Now, the thing is, is am I constantly listening to God? Because I do believe that God speaks to all of us and we hear it. Sometimes we just don't want to hear what he's saying, you know? We are more in tune uh, with pleasing our flesh. And I have learned that uh, the main reason for prayer and fasting is because you, submit, you subdue your flesh and you feed the spirit by praying to God. So you're giving yourself a connection to the true and living God while at the same time you're holding down the thing that seems to uh, try and set itself in between you and God, which is your flesh. So uh, the, the Bible tells us constantly to subdue our flesh. Uh, Paul calls it beating your flesh into submission. Basically, beating your flesh into submission so that your spirit prevails. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, uh, Joshua received instructions from the Lord, specific instructions. And several times we receive specific instructions from the Lord. Now, whether we obey them or not, because sometimes they seem far-fetched. I received one time a word from the, from God, and it was to, my, to give to my wife. And uh, we want to discuss whether or not it was, uh, it was, it was a word about her hair. And, uh, to leave it natural for a, a pay period, I, I believe was the word. And sometimes we get these weird things from God, and we can't understand them. I don't, I don't know what the what the purpose for that was, but I know that that's what I received in my spirit. And when you get to knowing this true and living God, when you're communing with Him through prayer, when you meditate and you can hear His word and hear from Him. Sometimes you'll hear things from him that don't make sense to us. But remember, we're human. And we look at things from a human point of view, you know. And God is an eternal being. And he has that same thing for us. So the way that he thinks and the way that he sees things are not the same that we uh, see things. Amen? Amen. And he'll help you block things, too. Like the basketball player. Uh, uh, uh. Not today. <laughs> no, no. No, 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 yes. Satan. Not today. Yes, because the Bible, the book of James says that it says, submit to God first. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. First thing we need to do, though, is submit to God. Then we resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that is specific instructions. Now, these aren't as far-fetched as walking around the uh, the wall uh, seven times and then giving a loud shout. This is a simple recipe. Submit to God, resist the devil, and watch him run. Amen. Amen. So, I would also like to uh, bring up, we also have some questions that we'd like to ask really uh, briefly. And they are in the text on page 335. And they are And they are, the first one is, uh, for the search of the scriptures, is what are we supposed to do? What are the people, what were they supposed to do when they heard the, when they heard the horn blow? So what is the answer to that one, Mr. Beth? When they heard the blast on the ram's horns, all of them were supposed to shout as loud as they could. Amen, amen. So that was the specific instructions from the Lord. So the next question is, why were the people to shout? 
but why were the people to shout? Minister Beth? So that the walls of Jericho could come down. Amen. Shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Amen. And a final question. What did the people do on the seventh day? They got up and marched around the town as they had done before. Amen. And we'll uh, briefly ask these questions discuss, and then discuss the meaning. And it says, what significance do you see in the repetition of the number seven in the conquest of Jericho? Now, that's a very good question. And uh, some of our uh, Bible scholars are better numerologists, and I've always struggled with the numbers, but I do know that the number seven is representative of God. So when they were to walk around the, build, around the city seven times under God's instruction, I believe that that was to represent that it wasn't by their might, but by the might of God that brought the walls down. And the second question asks, what lessons can you take from this text about victory in your own personal battles? And I think what we can learn from this is that uh, since God is the one that did this, um, that we can also expect God to fight our battles. And if we closely follow his instructions, the victory is already ours. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for Cyber Sunday School. And, but before we end, we will end as we do each day in a word of prayer. Father God, we call upon you in the name of our Savior, Christ Jesus, giving you thanks, Lord God, for this lesson. We pray that you show us uh, how to live your will, Father God, and that you strengthen us to do your will, Father, and follow their instructions. We give you honor, glory, and praise by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Until we see you next week, God bless. God bless.